collapse, if and when it comes again, will this time be global. No longer can any individual nation collapse. World civilization will disintegrate as a whole. What may be a catastrophe to administrators need not be to the bulk of the population. Collapse is not intrinsically a catastrophe. It is a rational, economizing process that may well benefit much of the population. Joseph Tainter Good evening. This is Radio Free Bichel. I'm Alphonse. Tonight, Tainter's Collapse and Complexity. Imagine you get a job as a high-flying lawyer in New York City. You're making a big salary, but you're working long hours, and as a result, you have to spend money on a lot of other things. You have to spend money on a house in an expensive neighborhood. You have to spend money on clothes, on flying, on a nice car. When you have children, you have to hire tutors for them because you don't have the time to spend looking after them. And at some point in your life, you look at what you're doing and you think, everything I'm doing is work and nothing I'm doing is for me or my family. Maybe it would make more sense to find a small place out of the way somewhere Reduce my income, but reduce my spending too. Simplify my life. Maybe my life would be better then. In other words, you figure that you might actually be better off if you simplified your life instead of living with all the complexity that allows you to be wealthy. That, in a nutshell, at a personal level, is what Tainter is talking about when he talks about the collapse of societies or civilizations. Collapse isn't something forced on a society, at least not in most cases. It's a choice. It may be a bad choice, but it may also be a less bad choice than the alternatives. There have been many theories of the collapse of civilizations. One particularly popular approach, going back to ancient times, is that a civilization is like a person. It's vigorous when it's young, stable when it's mature, and then it declines and disintegrates in old age. While that might be a description of what happens to some civilizations, it doesn't explain anything about why a society collapses, or why it collapses when it collapses. There are other theories that people have come up with. For example, that a society may collapse when it runs out of a crucial resource. Or it may be attacked by outsiders, like the barbarians who invaded the Roman Empire. Or it may be a consequence of class conflict within, or the corruption of elites. But Tainter says these explanations are weak because societies and civilizations often weather such crises. There may be natural disasters that they survive. Barbarian invaders who don't get through. In fact, Rome had fought off stronger attempts at invasion before it finally fell. And problems like class conflict and corruption are normal in societies. They're usually there all along. So why would they suddenly cause collapse? Tainter's theory of collapse is in his book, The Collapse of Complex Societies, published in 1988. By collapse, he means a rapid reduction in complexity. Complexity may sound like an abstraction, but it's actually something fairly concrete, something that we could find proxy measures for. For example, a complex society would be one, likely, that has more social roles, more different kinds of jobs more different kinds of products that are produced, more that are consumed, more trading partners, more different scales of settlements from villages to cities, deeper social hierarchies, and so on. So complexity is something that you could actually measure, and a rapid significant reduction in complexity would be noticeable. What Tainter says is that as societies encounter challenges, they increase their complexity. For example, say your society has warlike neighbors, and it faces the threat of invasion. In response, it develops a military. That means now that there's a hierarchy within the military of officers and soldiers. Arms and equipment need to be manufactured, supplies, uh, training academies, and so on. So there's an increase in the complexity of the society to address the problem of the threat of invasion. Say the country actually goes to war and conquers the warlike neighbor. Now there needs to be an administration to manage the new territory. Again, there's an increase in complexity. And that complexity has costs. That army has to be paid. Someone has to pay for the equipment. Someone has to pay for the training. Somebody has to pay for the administration of the new territory. The problem, Tainter says, 
is that as the society becomes more complex, the benefits of additional complexity reduce and the costs increase, or at least the balance between those shifts so the returns on the investment in complexity go down. One of the clearest examples of this is food. In hunter-gatherer societies, food existed in nature, and all people had to do was go and find it and collect it. And in fact, those people had some of the most leisure time of any people ever. As human population increased, that was a challenge that was met by finding more food sources and intensifying agriculture. By actually growing food rather than going and finding it, people could grow more food in the same amount of land. But it took more work. In other words, it took more human energy to grow food than it did to find it. And this continued right up until the present day. In fact, right now, it takes about 10 calories of fossil fuel energy to grow one calorie of food energy. If it wasn't for the essential free energy that fossil fuel gave us, we would be starving to death. And Tainter argues this applies to other resources, too. No matter what the resource is, whether it's oil supplies, or forests, or fisheries, humans naturally go after the low-hanging fruit first. And the result is that as we need every additional fish, every additional barrel of oil, and so on, that additional fish, that additional barrel of oil, is more expensive to collect. The same is true for an empire, like the Roman Empire, invading other territories in order to take their wealth. As it conquers more territory, the administrative overhead grows faster than the wealth from the newly conquered territories. And as that return on investment decreases, it may start to look to some of the people in the society as if this isn't worth it anymore. There may even come a point where the benefit of invading one more territory or extracting one more barrel of oil just isn't worth it, where the cost actually exceeds the benefit. Now, one response to this might be to say, well, technology will solve this. But the same phenomenon occurs with technology, as Tainter demonstrates. We go after the low-hanging technologies first, just as we went after the low-hanging resources. You can see this, for example, with computer chips. For a long time, Moore's Law ruled, and computer chips rapidly got more sophisticated and cheaper. But in the past decade or so, that has slowed down, and this happens in technological development generally. Technology isn't a way out. It's just one more example of diminishing returns. The one thing that can be a way out, Tainter says, is a new source of energy, as, for example, when we started exploiting fossil fuels and oil. But that cost is not necessarily distributed equally among the people in a society. Those who are part of the additional complexity are having resources allocated to them in order to manage things. For example, a military empire has to spend on its soldiers. Or, if it doesn't spend on the soldiers, they're likely to revolt. So there comes a point where some of the groups in society may find that they might be better off if the society was less complex. The farmers may find that they are paying high taxes to maintain an army that doesn't seem to be benefiting them, for example. And at that point, they may prefer collapse. And Tainter said, in fact, that happened, that many of the Romans welcomed the barbarian invasions because it wiped away the expensive taxes and administration that they were paying. Now, when I say taxes, I don't necessarily mean government costs. Those costs could be in any institution in society. Complexity can be all over the place. Now, if Tainter is right, this pattern of diminishing marginal returns strikes every society, and ours is no exception. In fact, when I look at the quality of living from 40 or 50 years ago, it seems to me that it has not gone up. Back then, a single income with a job that didn't necessarily require university education was sufficient to support a house, a family, education, and so on. And today it's not. Our inflation statistics may suggest that we are better off because we have better phones and better televisions. But when you look at the essentials of life, things like housing, transportation, food, education, and health care, those things are extremely expensive. And one of the reasons they're expensive is because of increased complexity. So it might be that many of us would be better off with what Tainter would describe as a collapse, a significant, rapid reduction in complexity. 
I should just note that collapse in Tainter's terms doesn't have to be a free fall. It doesn't have to mean the elimination of society altogether. It simply means reduced complexity. We might be better off with it, he says, but it can't happen. He says collapse occurs and can only occur in a power vacuum. What he means is that a society that's in competition with other societies can't collapse. If it tries, it'll basically be taken over. And when it's taken over, it's unlikely to become less complex. And in fact, we've seen this. When Greece hit the wall financially in the 2010s and tried to go bankrupt, it wasn't allowed to. It was bailed out by the rest of Europe. Even though the administrators and politicians who arranged the bailout knew that Greece could never pay back the money. And yet they bailed it out, and then they extracted wealth from Greece by privatizing public assets. So Tainter says, in societies and competition, collapse can't happen unless they all collapse together. They have to keep competing. And as they continue to compete, much of the population may find that it is immiserated, as complexity increases and it has to be paid for somehow by someone. Now, one of the interesting things about Tainter's theory is that it's not political. For Tainter, none of this is a consequence of conflict between classes. Class conflict may be normal, but because it's normal, it can't explain exceptional events like collapses. But if you look at the dynamic within a society, there's obviously a class component. The people who are benefiting the most from the increased complexity are going to be the administrators, the managers, and the leaders, and so on. And the people who are going to be paying it are the masses of the population, the workers. For the administrators, increased complexity is what pays their wages. They don't want to collapse. For the majority of the population, collapse might bring benefits. If competition with other societies prevents collapse, that is actually to the benefit of the administrative class. It might seem beneficial, then, to actually simply reduce complexity slowly rather than collapsing suddenly. But that is very difficult, Tainter says. It basically doesn't happen, because it's much easier to add complexity than it is to eliminate complexity. And that, although he doesn't say it, may be the consequence of class dynamics, because those with the greatest interest in complexity are those who make a living from it, and they have no interest at all in allowing it to be reduced. Despite exhausting resources and the environment's capacity to absorb our wastes, According to Tainter, it's highly unlikely that we would be able to simplify our way to sustainability. So we're in a bind. We can't collapse because we're in competition until we all hit the wall together, the whole world, and then there's potentially a global collapse, as he says. Or we find some new source of energy, and that source of energy allows us to continue longer. Unfortunately, that doesn't seem to be on the horizon. This is Alphonse for Radio Free Bichelle, www.bessedel.ca. Good night.